My name is Sherry Burcham. I'm a family life educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and I'd like to welcome all of you to another session of the Summer Self-Care Series. Um, this series is actually a collaboration between the uh, U of I Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois, and it's designed to connect those across the state with the researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. Um, if you have any questions during the program, you can type them in the chat box. Um, but we are anticipating many uh, people on today. So um, we'd like to ask that you use the chat box sparingly, um, mostly for questions rather than comments. Um, we will address those questions, some of them during the session and some of them will um, be held for later, just so you know, okay? Um, now I would like to introduce our speaker today. Her name is Emily Erlenbach, and she graduated from UC Davis in 2017 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior. Physical activity and sports have always been a large part of her life, so she wanted to continue her graduate work studying exercises effects on the brain structure and function. Last month, she earned her Master's of Science degree in kinesiology, congratulations, here at the University of um, Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign and is currently working toward her PhD in that same field. Emily conducts her research through the Exercise Psychology Lab, whose mission is to explore the biopsychosocial health benefits of physical activity across the lifespan. So um, without further ado, uh, Emily, she's going to be talking about how exercise can affect stress, anxiety, and depression. So if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, hello, everybody. As uh, Sherry just said, my name is Emily, and I am super excited today to be talking to all of you um, about this topic, which hopefully everyone can relate to. I know, especially uh, given our current pandemic situation, I'm sure everyone, all of you in some form of capacity have felt a little more stressed, anxious, um, or depressed, and how we can use exercise, which is a free lifestyle intervention to help. There we go. Okay, so um, a little bit again about me. So I'm from San Diego, California, living in the cornfields and Central Illinois has definitely been a big change, but I've really grown to love it. Um, I went to my undergraduate at UC Davis in California. I just received my master's in kinesiology and I'm currently um, working towards my PhD now. Uh, my specific research interests are understanding the combined and independent effects of exercise and sedentary time on health and well-being. And, and when I'm not working, I love doing triathlons and consuming ice cream, my absolute love. So that's a little bit about me. A uh, couple disclaimers first before we get in depth. Um, while I'll be talking in depth about stress, anxiety, and depression, I am not a doctor. I am not a trained psychologist by any means. Um, I'm not providing any medical advice. This is just meant to be informative um, within the scope of my knowledge. As with any mental health condition, please seek appropriate help. Um, stress, anxiety, and depression can arise due to many factors. So throughout this presentation, um, I will be showing or talking about a lot of the physiological mechanisms, um, some triggers of these um, mental health states, but there are so many factors that can contribute. There's no one simple explanation. And lastly, I just want to uh, end on the note that it's okay to have these feelings of stress, anxiety, or depression. I really like this quote um, from Stephen Hawking. One of the basic rules of the universe is that nothing is perfect. Perfection simply doesn't exist. Without imperfection, neither you nor I would exist. I love that because it's reminding us that, you know, these feelings which might make us not feel okay, that is in itself okay. Um, so just keep that in mind. Our learning trajectories today are um, as follows. So first we're gonna establish definitions of stress, anxiety, and depression. Get us some really good foundation of what exactly these three mental states are. And then we're gonna dive into the, more of the biology of stress, which can, our body's responses to stress and stressful events um, really is kind of the root, can be the root. Again, as I said, there's many, many, many um, explanations for what triggers these, but 
our body's responses to stress are a lot of times at the root of these um, mental health states. Um, we'll examine primary components of anxiety. So it's a very multifaceted uh, state. Understands what happens to the body when we are stressed and are anxious. And, and understand how exercise can specifically help these feelings and then we'll go a little bit into depression and understanding how exercise can help that as well. And end on the note with practical recommendations to start exercising. So first little interactive question, I'd love to hear, um, what do you do to feel better when you feel stressed, anxious, and or depressed? What are some things that you engage in that make you feel better? Uh, so put your answers in the chat. I'd love to see what your responses are. Walk, run, art, dance, pray, dance. Chocolate, yoga, listen to music, walking, mountains, playing with my kids, eat, ice cream, TV, yoga, pray, just reading off what I see here, running, breathing exercises, really just gardening, deep breathing, pets. So, so I'm seeing so many different diverse forms, lots and lots of forms of exercise. Um, breathing is great, um, doing some sort of hobby, eating in there. So all very common um, behaviors to help us feel better. All right, thank you so much for sharing. So let's start off with some foundational definitions. So what is stress? Stress in and of itself is a state of disharmony or a threat to homeostasis. Uh, I'm not sure if, how familiar you might be with this term of homeostasis. Um, but that's defined as our body's steady state, and it's a steady internal, physical, and chemical conditions that are all maintained by living systems. So any living system, um, be it a cell, a plant, to a human, um, we all want to just be in this state of harmony and balance. Um, however, when we feel um, a threat to that balance, um, be it something that either physically or psychologically might throw us off, our body has um, resources to adapt to that. And our, we experience physiological changes to increase alertness, our focus and energy to this threat, because ultimately we wanna get back to that state of balance. And stress especially arises when the perceived demands um, that we might need to cope with that threat exceed our perceived resources, so what we actually have. And so there's that state of imbalance, which leads to the body's stress response to get back to balanced. Anxiety, on the other hand, is more of an emotion that's characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes. And the key thing here is that they may occur in the absence of an actual stressor. So while anxiety is a reaction to a stressful event, more often it's characterized by feeling these states of worry and tension when there actually is no current threat. And depression, lastly, is a mood disorder that causes severe symptoms which affect how you feel, think, and handle daily activity. And I'll get a little more into that definition in a little bit. So like I said, in a very, very, very simplistic sense, stress is the ultimate biological and physiological response to some sort of imbalance. And then excessive stress can oftentimes lead us to feeling anxious. And high levels of anxiety can oftentimes contribute to depression. That's a very simplified um, process. Again, you do not have to be stressed to be depressed. You do not have to feel anxiety to be depressed. There's so many different factors, um, but that is a very simplified. However, what these all have in common is that they affect how we act on or perceive the world around us. So how did we evolve to this stress revolve system? So I like to think back to you know, millions of years ago um, when humans were just living, you know, back in the caves. Um, and our biggest stress response was not being eaten or not. So our stress system was, system was shaped by natural selection to adjust for physiological processes and behavior to changing circumstances. So in a very natural sense, it's very simplified sense, natural selection, you know, selected that whoever survives being eaten, whoever has the best response to some sort of threat that might um, kill them, We'll get to pass on those survival genes. And that's essentially evolved to our fight or flight response, which is probably something that you've heard of in some sort. Um, and essentially what that is, it's when you are presented with a stress, such as a ferocious tiger is coming at you, 
your body is either going to make a very quick decision to fight that stress head on or run away from that stress, somehow making a decision to tackle that stress. Furthermore, natural selection has shaped those mechanisms that adjust the threshold or magnitude of our stress responses as a function of prior experience. And this is important to keep in mind for later um, when we talk about how exercise can help us cope with some stress. So the more we handle stress in a way, the more in a healthy way we experience stress, our body gets better at being able to cope with it and handle it. As I said, stress can actually be a very useful reaction. Um, so a lot of times being stressed or being highly anxious aroused gets very bad rep. And it is bad when it is over um, expressed. However, it is evolved to be very useful. And as you can see right here in this um, bell curve right here, our stress response is um, evolved to allow us to get to that optimal arousal state where we can perform our best given the situation. Um, if you are, again, a tiger comes at you and you are low aroused, you have tired, your body's not alert, that tiger is going to get you pretty quick. However, your body the one person whose body is able to quickly arouse them to get their optimal arousal performance, mobilize your resources and you handle that situation, that would be very beneficial. Then it gets to the very end of the spectrum where you have too high of arousal and this is where stress and anxiety really become um, not beneficial because they'll actually impair your performance because you get so anxious and worked up that you're not optimizing um, your resources to perform efficiently. So there's two different types of acute or two different types of stress. And again, I say over and over, stress is really this our foundation of all of these mental health uh, conditions. So an acute bout of stress is something that you or I probably experience very frequently um, in certain capacities on a daily basis. So it's a single bout. It is a bout of stress that has a beginning and an end. You might have felt for a moment, you might be walking in the street, realize, oh no, did I forget to turn off? my oven and you feel that sense of stress your heart starts beating your breath picks up and you feel very worked up however you might call home you might realize that oh it is turned off or you remember turning off and then it goes back to you go back to that normal balanced state so once that stress is gone everything subsides and this again can happen over and over um, in various capacities throughout your day Chronic and our body, excuse me, is built to be very resilient to that, so we can bounce back pretty quick. Uh, chronic stress, however, is due to repeated exposure to a threat, and this is more um, long-lasting threats, such as stressing about your job or money, um, family problems, just something that constantly has you under stress over long periods of time. And with that body's stress responses and constantly being activated, it can really wear down your body and your mind. Um, and this is what can contribute to significant health problems, which I will talk about in a little bit. So what actually happens when we are stressed? <clears throat> so I will use just, again, the very basic example of I am out walking and I see a tiger across the street, probably very unlikely in Champaign, um, but this is you know, a very good example of a stressor. So there's two types of stressors. There's an external stressor, which is me seeing the tiger. Um, that is an external, outside of me threat um, that all of a sudden I see and I go, oh no. An internal stressor is more physiological, or excuse me, psychological. So that might be you just had a deadline imposed on you that you need to complete, you know, by the end of the day. Uh, and this is very, you know, it's not physical, but it's a psychological stressor that's causing you stress. So I'll continue with my example of I see the tiger. Um, then I go to my primary appraisal. So this happens very, very, very quickly. Um, you know, in the milliseconds to second level where you assess the situation as important or demanding. So I see the tiger, my body, my mind instantly assesses as, oh, this is not a good situation. I need to divert all of my physiological resources to handle this situation because this is not good and this is getting me very worked up. That's your primary appraisal. You deem that as important. Your secondary appraisal is your body assesses your resources to cope with the situation. What are you able to do? And you're kind of reviewing those fight or flight options. Do I want to fight the tiger? Do I want to flight the tiger? What is best my ability? 
obviously me versus a tiger, I'm probably going to go with flight. Um, but again, this is a decision you make very quickly. And so then we get to the stage of resistance. So our stress hormone pathways are activated. And I'll talk about hormones in a little bit. This is how your body communicates to all the body parts to mobilize your internal resources to activate, to act. And at this point, the stressor may be resolved. And if it's resolved, um, you know, that's kind of that acute bout of stress. I run away from the tiger, I'm out of the situation, my stress hormone pathways get downregulated and everything goes back to normal. However, if this is more of a chronic stress situation that's getting me stressed over and over and over again, and I'm constantly stressed, I might progress to an exhaustion phase where the demands of the stress exceed my ability to adapt. And I am just depleting my internal resources to handle some sort of stress. Um, again, this happens more, well, I don't wanna say with internal external, but again, for that internal stress of constantly having you know, deadlines imposed on you and you're constantly stressed about work or deadlines um, and your body can't just keep up with all this activation, that's where we get health problems. So I'm going to transition to talking a little bit more about the physiological responses and what is going on inside our body. So first is we perceive a stressor, be it an internal stressor, something that is psychologically getting us really worried and stressed, or a physical stressor. And obviously, the first things first is we perceive this stressor, be it we see it with our own eyes, or we, are, we hear it, be it from our boss, be it from you know, a computer screen where we read something, we perceive that there is something that is threatening our balance and our homeostasis. And our brain is specifically the hypothalamus is our first response, um, this is the stress command center. So this is what gets our stress response started. And it produces some hormones to contribute to, excuse me, communicate to another area of the brain called anterior pituitary. Um, so it, the hypothalamus is telling this next region that, hey, we're stressed, we need to respond. And this gets started, it's called the HPA, or sorry, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis. And this is our stress response system. Through this, our brain communicates to, a to the adrenal cortex, which is actually located right above our kidneys. Um, and that adrenal cortex is what produces cortisol, which I'm guessing you might've heard of, that's our body's main stress response. Cortisol then gets sent around to the rest of the body um, to tell the rest of the body, to tell your muscles, to tell your lungs, your heart, a lot of your uh, different systems that, hey, we're stressed, we need to start acting. This is more of a uh, flow diagram here. And what you'll see here is that this HP axis has a negative feedback loop built in. So it's not just constantly pumping out cortisol and pumping out, pumping out, pumping out. There's a feedback loop. Um, that when that stressor subsides, or when we start to perceive that this stressor no longer exists, be it our external stressor that we saw is gone, or we've met the deadline and it's not stressed anymore, we follow down this chain and we start to produce less cortisol. And our body can sense that, hey, we have less cortisol being produced, so there's not much stress going on anymore. So in the hypothalamus, reduces the amount of hormones it produces. So it's this negative feedback loop um, that once things start to lower, it kind of halts the brakes on that pathway higher up to slow it down. Um, however, and then we get back to normal. But if we have constant activation of the stress response system and we have high levels of cortisol that are increasingly being produced and increasingly circulating throughout our body um, through chronic stress activation, this is what can lead, contribute to anxiety and depression. So we get a little more into actually what is happening to our body. So I'm gonna be focusing on five different systems throughout the body and what happens, um, how they respond in our stress response loop and what happens to them when we are under chronic stress over long periods of time. So first starting with the musculoskeletal system, which essentially is talking about our body's muscles. When we're stressed, when we experience a stress, our muscle's natural reaction is to tense up. We wanna tense up and be prepared for action. Um, it's our body's natural response to preparing it against injury or pain. 
Um, so by tensing up, you know, if your stress response is there's some sharp object or something coming at you. You might have felt, you know, if you're driving, all of a sudden you see a car coming at you, the race stops, and you might feel your body all of a sudden tense up and be prepared for, you know, an oncoming collision. Um, under acute stress, like I said, muscles tense up all at once. And once that stress passes, you know, once that car has diverted us and has not hit us, we go back to normal, our muscles relax, and our body gets back to our homeostasis and carries on. However, chronic stress, so if we're constantly feeling that stress, our muscles are constantly tensing and releasing and tensing and releasing. Um, and our shoulders, neck, and head, you know, these muscles, this is what contributes to stress, headaches, and migraines. This is why you might feel these kinds of pains when you are constantly feeling um, stress. Uh, however, in your lower back and upper extremities, such as your arms, muscle pain there is oftentimes linked to stress, especially in job stress that they found. So you might be stressed, um, you might be sitting at your desk hunched over, your arms are, and your shoulders are hunched, and pain there can be linked to job stress. So it's interesting how certain areas um, relate to different types of stress and the pain you might feel across your muscles. The next is the respiratory system. <clears throat> so when we're stressed, our respiratory system ramps up. Again, I'm sure you've probably felt, you know, when you have a moment that stresses you out, you remember something you forgot. Um, you might feel all of a sudden your heart rate picking up and your breathing start to pick up. And the reason for that is your body needs to quickly distribute oxygen throughout the body. Um, so you increase your breathing to increase the amount of oxygen because um, if you might know, cells use oxygen to produce energy to be able to combat that threat. And that's why we feel that shortness of breathing and rapid breath. Um, during acute stress, very, very acute stress, your blood flow increases. Because remember, your blood is what transports oxygen across your body to different regions, to different cells in your body. So blood flow can increase up to 300 to 400%. Again, this is very, very short burst. Your heart beats faster to get the oxygen moving. And this will also go into um, when I talk about the cardiovascular, cardiovascular system. People with that respiratory disease, um, they can manage this additional work to breathe comfortably just fine. Like I say, the body is very adaptable. So once our acute stress has passed, um, we get back to normal. However, people with pre-existing respiratory conditions such as asthma or COPD, even just acute stress that makes them breathe quickly and in an acute bad time can really make their breathing problems worse. So even acute stress can be problematic for people with such pre-existing respiratory conditions. Chronic stress, again, can contribute to increased blood pressure because we have more blood being pumped through our blood muscles, or excuse me, our blood vessels to get the oxygen flowing. It can overwork our heart. And it can put extensive stress on our lungs because our lungs are constantly working faster. This is very similar and kind of leads very connected to the cardiovascular system. Excuse me. Again, the heart and blood vessels are responsible for that coordination of the body's stress response. It's through our blood vessels that our body is able to send um, hormones, which are basically the body's messengers throughout to different parts of the body to let them know how to respond. The blood vessels are also very important to transporting oxygen uh, to get to different cells. So when we are stressed, we experience an increased heart rate and stronger contractions. Again, we need to get that blood flowing because we need to transport whatever is in our blood to get it to different parts of our body. Under that acute bout of stress, our blood vessels, the direct blood, they get larger um, in order to um, accommodate more blood. The increase, we increase the amount of blood that gets pumped through the body, and this can elevate our blood pressure. Um, and then once the stress episode passes, the body returns to its normal state. As you can imagine, under chronic stress, this can contribute to long-term heart problems. By constantly ongoing increases in your heart rate and increase that blood pressure, uh, that can lead to hypertension, heart attack, or stroke. Our endocrine system is responsible for producing our hormones throughout the body. And the key hormones um, that are experienced during stress are cortisol. So that's produced in the adrenal cortex, or <clears throat> in that area by our kidneys, the adrenal cortex. And increased cortisol production is normally produced at lower levels throughout the day because cortisol is responsible for mobilizing our body's energy resources. 
Um, when our body needs more energy, it'll mobilize that. When we don't need as much, it'll reduce a little bit. Uh, adrenaline, I'm sure you've probably heard, you like get that surge of adrenaline in a moment of panic. That's our fight or flight response. So that's what activates that response. And lastly, glutocorticoids are a class of steroid hormones, such as cortisol, that regulate our immune system and reduce inflammation. Again, during stress, our, what our body's response does is it upregulates and really pumps up certain aspects of our body that are useful and needed in a response system, or excuse me, in a stress response. And it downregulates and decreases the functioning of other systems that are not as important at that moment. So when we're stressed, obviously we need energy. We need to be able to respond. So cortisol is going to increase our blood sugar and promote that energy metabolism to get that surge of energy going. And it's also going to be responsible, these hormones, for suppressing of non-essential bodily functions. This includes our immune system. In a moment of stress, our body is less concerned with, um, you know, fighting potential viruses or our immune response. Also, digestion slows down. It halts immediate digestion um, and, you know, focuses on just the energy that we have. You'll increase your blood flow to muscles. So it diverts your blood away from certain unessential um, organs of the body at that moment to get to the muscles to allow you to act. And lastly, it'll dilate your pupils because your body wants to let in more light to be able to see, to increase your arousal, to respond. Over chronic stress, like I said, because non-essential immune function, or non-essential functions such as your immune, digestive, reproductive systems and growth responses, um, those are downregulated during stress. If you're constantly stressed, these systems are going to be significantly effective. Having chronically high adrenaline levels can lead to high blood pressure, anxiety, or heart damage because our body is constantly in this very, very alert fight or flight response. And lastly, we get impaired communication between our immune system and that HPA axis. So again, our body is speaking at that because stress and the immune system are very much tied together. I'm guessing you may have heard about that connection between stress and immunity. While that is, I believe that's been another topic that's talked about here. In our lecture series, high stress can definitely negatively affect the immune system. And that's because um, of this constant activation of that stress response that downregulates and decreases um, the immune system functioning. And lastly, we have the gastrointestinal system. So this is your digestive system. And it's very interesting, the stomach is constantly in communication with the brain. It kind of has its own um, hotline to it. So the gut knows when you're feeling stressed, and that's the butterflies in your stomach. Uh, I've definitely had before, and I'm sure you have too, in some point, you know, you're walking down the street and you realize, oh no, I, I forgot this deadline. And you just feel your stomach drop, and you feel your stomach's not worked up. And that's because your stomach has a very unique connection, um, communication line with your brain. And stress can affect this brain gut communication. So under acute stress, you might feel pain, bloating, or other gut discomfort more easily. It is actually a um, misconception that stress causes ulcers. Um, stress does not actually increase acid production in the stomach, nor does it cause those stomach ulcers. Um, stomach ulcers are actually caused by a bacterial infection. However, when you're stressed, it might make these ulcers more bothersome. So it's kind of a misconception a lot of times um, gets passed around. Acute stress can also increase or decrease your appetite, um, definitely affecting you know, the food you'll take in. Your digestion slows down because when your body is stressed, at that moment, it's not very much focused on completing digestion of the sandwich you just ate. It's diverting that blood and those resources away to your muscles and other areas. And this also will go along and negatively affect uh, your nutrient absorption. You can imagine again, with chronic stress over and over, this will have very negative consequences. So stress can be associated with changes in the gut bacteria. And this is a whole other topic, but the gut bacteria, um, you know, our gut is filled with millions and millions of um, bacteria particles that I'm not too familiar with this field, but I do know have been found to be associated with mood. Um, and so when that balance, that flora in our stomach is affected, that can really influence our mood. So that can contri certainly contribute to feelings of stress and anxiety. 
poor diets, again, if you are either eating too much or you're stopped eating or you're not eating as much, you're not getting the proper nutrients, this can also lead to mood deterioration. And lastly, having that weakened intestinal barrier, that stomach barrier, your gut bacteria can enter the body. Most of the time, um, our body does have the resources to be able to combat such bacteria in the body. <clears throat> However, um, through our inflammation response. But since we now know that stress can affect that inflammation response and because it affects our immune system, now we don't have the resources to be able to handle all this gut bacteria that has entered our body. And this can also um, make us sick. Um, Emily? We have a question um, about the, the bell curve. Um, does the bell curve explain why some people work better under a deadline? And then the mm -hmm. second part, you might be addressing it later. Um, mm -hmm. How does one keep their response at the bell curve peak versus slipping over the top into unhealthy realm? That's a very good question. So to address the first question, which I believe was, how do people work better? better. Mm -hmm. So everyone has their own kind of way of handling stress. I myself personally don't, ha don't handle myself very well under stress. And a lot of this I know is going to be a very satisfactory answer, but can do with genetics um, or environment, how we are, you know, past experiences with stress, um, just our genetic, our body's predisposition and the ability to mobilize our stress resources. So there's not a very good answer that I personally have. Um, a lot of it too might come with, um, and this actually will get into exercise about how people respond to the stress. And we'll see even with exercise, how it can be used to help people. People can use exercise to help with stress in different ways. So in a way what I'm trying to get at is the stress response system, while we all experience the same physiological mechanisms, Everyone has such an can have such an individual excuse me individualized way of handling and coping with what is going on. Um, so I hope that answered the first question as best to my ability. And I'm sure there's a lot more. I'm not trained extensively um, in the psychological and treating it, but that's from what I believe from my reading. And I think the second part was how to stay in that optimal arousal. Um, and this is where a lot of times um, again psychologists or trained professionals can help you. It does have to go into, you know, how are you, how well are you able to cope with it? Um, I think it's also finding your own, like understanding your own stress response um, and understanding where, what tips your balance. So what, doing this might require some introspection about what tips you over the edge um, and finding that and then working from there. Does that answer the question a little bit? I hope a little bit. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank, oh, thank you. you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. All right, so that was a good question. Okay, <clears throat> um, so like I said, so this is anxiety and this actually does segue into where we are. So, you know, when people are tipped over the edge and they're tipped over the bell curve, um, not downward slope, this is often where we get anxiety. And anxiety is defined as if by a persistent excessive worrying that don't go away even in the absence of a stressor. So for example, the tiger in the streets example, um, you know, that's a real stressful situation when you see a tiger in the street. However, anxiety can translate into you are now constantly feeling stressed and worried about the presence of a tiger even when there isn't one. Um, so I could be sitting in my office right here worrying about, oh no, what if there's a tiger, what will I do? And worrying and thinking, um, but there actually isn't that threat. And anxiety is characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts and physical changes like increased blood pressure, sweating, trembling, dizziness, rapid heartbeat, all very, very similar to what we have in the stress response. So that's why I really went in depth um, with our body stress response because many of these same symptoms and many of the causes of symptoms um, overlap with anxiety and stress. And chronic anxiety can lead to depression. However, I will emphasize again that that is not the single soul path. Um, depression can come in many different forms and not all chronic anxiety leads to depression. So they can, they don't always go together, but this is what is, can be found. So 
I'm gonna go through the different widely recognized types of anxieties quickly. So generalized anxiety disorder is probably one of the more common types of diagnosable um, forms of anxiety that you would come across. Um, it's just this chronic anxiety of exaggerated worry and tension. Worrying most days for at least six months. Um, this is important, especially um, from a diagnosable standpoint. Again, I'm not a trained um, psychologist, psychiatrist, um, but this is what, if you were to see a um, mental health specialist, they would ask you about that and look at this timeline. Doing restless, wound up, easily fatigued, difficult concentrating, sleep problems, um, very much symptoms that we would see with stress over the long term. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, this is a disorder that can develop after exposure to a terrifying event or a deal in which grave physical harm occurred or was threatened. Um, you might often hear this with um, veterans or survivors of some sort of abuse. Um, you know, feeling this sense of anxiety and stress when they're no longer in threat, but they still have um, very much their body works up and experiences a stress response. Obsessive compulsive disorder um, is a probably very common one that many of you have heard of. So it's recurrent or unwanted thoughts or repeated behaviors. And these behaviors are performed hoping to make these obsessive thoughts and make them go away. Um, provides only temporary relief and you'll actually get more anxious when you don't perform them. So for example, washing your hands. Um, and it's very common when you know constantly, constantly wash your hands or wipe them down. Um, if you know someone in your life who might have some type of OCD, um, you know, they just, there's just something that they cannot, they can't continue on until this one thing is taken care of or until they complete this one behavior. Again, no immediate threat. There is no actual thing, you know, that might happen or will happen, but in their mind, they need this behavior to make this perceived threat go away. There's panic disorder, which is reoccurring unexpected panic attacks, which are intense fear that can come on quickly and reach their peaks. Um, they can occur unexpectedly and can be brought on by triggers such as a feared object or situation. Um, for example, public speaking. You know, some people might get so worked up over this fear of public speaking when in reality, you know, speaking in front of a crowd is relatively harmless. Nothing is really actually going to happen but some ex individuals who might genuinely experience panic attacks, just even at the thought of public speaking, um, will really work their body up and this perceived threat um, really gets them into a state of panic. Uh, phobia related disorders are as an intense fear, having a phobia or aversion to a specific object or situation. Uh, probably one of the most common phobias, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Um, I definitely had that growing up. Surprisingly, I kind of grew out of that. Um, but I had this absolute fear of daddy long legs spiders. Completely harmless spiders. Um, but when I would see one, I would just go crazy and terrified until I was out of the room and it was removed out of my sight. And last, there's social anxiety disorder, which is characterized by an overwhelming anxiety and excessive self-consciousness in everyday social situations. And this can be very paralyzing, um, especially too, because I'm sure almost all of you find yourselves in some capacity um, in a social situation every day. And having this crippling fear, um, overthinking and being very, very self-conscious in a relatively completely harmless environment, most people are just going about their day, you know, they're not thinking about it, but you might feel very um, overwhelmed with anxiety over being in this social situation. So these again are the most common types of disorders and there's lots of different sub fields as well. So what are the three components of anxiety? So these are kind of the three characterizations of being in this anxious state of mind. So there's thoughts, which are your perceptions and thoughts which revolve around themes of danger. So you perceive that there is some sort of threat um, and that you are vulnerable. Physical sensations, so very, very similar to our stress responses with rapid breathing, dizzy, chest pain, upset stomach, nausea, sweating, numbness, and tingling. Not all of these need occur. Uh, you might just experience a few of them, some of them. Um, so this doesn't necessarily have to all happen. 
And then it definitely affects your behaviors and cognitive processes. So you can either feel very hypervigilant, so very aware and alert. You might feel very irritable, restless. You might also be not be able to concentrate. You, bracing thoughts are often very common with um, anxiety or unwanted thoughts. You know, these thoughts which you know are not pleasant, which are not helpful, but you just can't get them out of your head and they keep racing through. All right, so now, we're, now that we have hopefully a very in-depth understanding of what is happening to our body when we are stressed and anxious, this might help us understand more about how exercise can really intervene. Um, first, I just wanna kind of take a step back into the research side and understand how do we study this? Um, obviously, you know, lots and pretty much all science that we have today started with an observation. Um, by some scientist, researcher, someone a long time ago. So a long time ago, someone probably observed either from themselves or from, you know, a friend or colleague that, hey, after I exercised or I did some movement, I felt better. I felt calmer. And this observation, simple observation, has led to this whole entire field of study, of studying exercise effects on basically mental health in general. And so when we want to study as a researcher, um, study the nuances of exercise and the stress anxiety relationship, there's two different types of research approaches. So the first is observational research. So that is just essentially asking a large sample of people about their exercise habits and asking about their feelings of stress and anxiety. And you want to see if there's a relationship between the responses. Is there a relationship between people who report exercising more and who may or may not feel more or less stressed. However, these can be hard sometimes to really um, establish causation. I'm sure you've heard uh, correlation does not equal causation. So can exercise cause people to feel less stressed? Or is it that people who are just naturally less stressed tend to exercise more? So that we can't answer with observational research. So we need to go into intervention studies. And this is actually, um, where you would recruit a sample of people and you would randomize them into two groups. So one group receives the exercise intervention. So you have them exercise for three times a week for three months. And the other group might be a control group where for three times a week for three months, they might read a book or do something else, non-exercise related. And at the end of the intervention, you want to see their group differences. How might they differ in their stress responses? And you see, hey, did the group that received this intervention change significantly? So that's essentially the type of research that has gone on to understand these four ways that I'm going to be talking about how exercise can help with stress and anxiety. So as I'll say, and I'll probably say repeat a couple of times, stress is a very individualized response. People respond to stress very differently. People handle stress very differently. And therefore, ways exercise can help stress can be very different across individuals. Um, so I'm going to go about four common ways that have been reported and observed how exercise can help. So the first is that exercise is a physical stressor. Um, remember how I said earlier that our bodies have evolved to be able to adapt to stress. So if we're stressed at a healthy level continually, our bodies get better at responding to that stress and we can become more efficient. This is where exercise comes in because exercise activates the same systems involved in responding to an external threat. When you exercise, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure temporarily increases, um, levels of cortisol temporarily increase. And this is good because through a healthy, regular activation of our stress systems, it may produce those beneficial adaptations. So our body becomes more efficient at responding to stress and our systems are able to respond to acute stress more effectively. So reduced figure and shorter duration. Exercise can also positively affect our chemical levels. So when we experience a stress, our bodies produce epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. And all of these molecules are responsible, as I've talked about, for preparing the body to react for a challenge. However, exercise can help regulate the production of these chemicals. And this can kind of, this can help control our overall response. Um, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, those are um, involved in that fight or flight response. So at being able to regulate and not having the body overproduce or go crazy producing them, we can kind of 
regulate our response system. Also, exercise can affect neurotransmitters in the brain, such as dopamine and serotonin. I'm sure you probably have heard of at least one of these. Um, they're oftentimes referred to as the happy chemicals, as they're associated with mood, pleasure, and reward. So exercise, by increasing production of these neurotransmitters, can positively affect your mood um, and just overall keep your mood at a higher level. Additionally, exercise can positively affect your behaviors. Um, one thing that exercise has been observed to do is positively affect self-esteem. Uh, self-esteem is often defined as your perception of your abilities, skills, and your qualities. How do you feel about yourself? Um, and this is very important for quality, uh, for your overall health and well-being. And this in itself is a, another large topic about how having good self-esteem um, really contributes to your health as high self-esteem is often linked with happiness and satisfaction. And people who do have healthy levels of self-esteem are less susceptible to psychological problems such as anxiety and depression. Um, additionally, regular exercise can positively affect your confidence or your self-efficacy. So how confident are you that you can handle a situation? Um, and oftentimes when you're more confident to handle a situation, you might be less stressed. So this actually does kind of um, answer the question that was asked earlier about why do some people respond better under stress than others. Uh, one possible explanation is that people might have greater self-efficacy or confidence in that domain um, or in that situation. For example, how can someone work so well under the pressure of a deadline um, versus some people can't? Well, the person who might be able to work better might have really strong self-efficacy and confidence that I know that within this deadline, I can do it. Yes, I might be stressed, but I have confidence that I can do it in, I can complete this project in two hours. Um, versus someone else might not have that confidence to complete that project in two hours, and they might feel more stressed. An exercise has been done to positively um, enhance our confidence in our abilities. Um, and this is important during the appraisal stage of assessing a threat. So when you are assessing, you know, what is this threat? How am I able to handle it? How bad is it? Um, when you assess, do I have the ability, do I have the confidence to do this? Um, and that is, can really set you up for quote unquote success in a stressful situation. And lastly, um, Emily, yes. Um, sorry about that. Um, oh. Just a question real quick one about the chemicals. Um, uh, produced again. Someone asked that since hormones are produced, how does going through menopause affect stress as it relates to hormones? That is a very good question. And mm -hmm. I personally do not have the answer for that. I am not very much trained um, in the experiences of menopause. Um, I do know very just that exercise can be very positive during menopause. Um, so I'm sure there is a connection. However, unfortunately, I am unable to answer that, um, but I would be happy to look into that and pass along information that I find. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, so as I said, exercise can be positive distraction. And there's this well-recognized uh, phenomenon called the timeout hypothesis, where just taking a break from your stress and your worries. I know a lot of you said that when you feel stressed anxious, you go for a walk or you jog or you do some sort of activity to distract you. And just by distracting your mind with a healthy activity allows you to you know, take a breather, come back with a clear mind, get in some perspective. It can also provide an opportunity for social interaction. Um, so just getting the opportunity to be with people and socialize can really be uplifting. And lastly, it's a fun and enjoyable activity. So finding and this, I will repeat this at the end too, an exercise that you enjoy and is fun. Because, you know, as much as I exercise can be great, if you do not enjoy going for a run, um, then that's not, at the end of the day, probably gonna be very beneficial. That might mean make you feel more stressed or frustrated. So it's very important to find an exercise that does provide a positive distraction and is enjoyable. So we're gonna segue into depression. So not getting into as much depth as I did with stress and anxiety, um, but definitely I wanted to touch on this because depression can kind of be, as you've seen, a lot of times a culmination of chronic st stress or chronic anxiety. 
So what happens with sadness is sadness is oftentimes a regular emotion that is due to situations. We might feel sad that summer is coming to an end, that our vacation is over. We might be sad at the end of a movie. Um, you know, there might be many, many things that make us sad. However, these feelings can come and go without significantly affecting our daily life. There's no real time frame that says, you know, oh, sadness has to last this many days before it turns into depression or whatnot. But ultimately, it's just sadness is a feeling that can come and go and it doesn't affect our day-to-day -day activities that much or significantly at all. Depression, however, is a diagnosable mood disorder, which does significantly impact our daily life. And it severely um, affects how we feel, think, and handle our daily activities, just such as sleeping, eating, working. Um, to be diagnosed with depression, symptoms must be present every day for at least two weeks. Um, this is the DSM, that is kind of the Bible of diagnosable uh, mental health disorders. Again, this is something that a psychologist or psychiatrist um, would really probe and ask you questions upon to be able to understand your symptoms, how long they've lasted, and understand um, if you are experiencing depression and what type. And it is one of the most common mental disorders in the USA, so it is very prevalent. Um, and yeah. So what causes depression? There are many explanations, many, many factors. So it's ultimately caused by a combination of genetic, biological, environmental, and psychological factors. So there are many things that can contribute to it, which is like I said, you don't need to experience stress and then anxiety to lead to depression. Um, however, common risk factors might include personal or family history of depression. So sometimes, for example, even having a family history of um, low serotonin levels um, or having some sort of biological predisposition to having low hormonal levels that might, or neurotransmitter levels that might um, cause someone to be more like prone to depression. Having major life changes, such as possibly losing a loved one, experiencing some sort of trauma or some very extreme type of stress. Uh, circle physical illnesses and medications might also um, cause depression as they might really disrupt your body's homeostasis um, and really disrupt that balance to the point where, um, especially neurologically, um, regions of your brain and those neurotransmitters that want to function in optimal level get disrupted and this can what can really affect your mood states. So very, you know, very in-depth um, explanations to the physiological underpinnings of depression. Um, but ultimately, what we see in depressed individuals is functional and structural changes in the brain structures. So we have, um, sh without getting to really too much, um, excuse me, too much in depth of neuroscience, you know, we have certain regions of the brain that are responsible for different processes and functions. And those structures of the brain communicate to each other. And under normal, healthy circumstances, um, there's a healthy line of communication. These brain structures are a certain size. Um, however, when in a depressed individual, we might see actual structural changes in certain brain structures. We might see them, um, we might see connectivity and communication between these brain structures um, not be functioning properly. And this can often lead to dysregulation of our mood. Um, we also see changes in the molecular processes within the brain. So hormones and neurotransmitters that are produced during stress and depression um, will disrupt those feedback loops that are very responsible for kind of blunting our response once we no longer need that response. However, if those get disrupted, then we are often, we might experience changes in mood. And lastly, there's also genetic and stress vulnerability. So genetics can play quite a large part in depression, um, just making someone more vulnerable to being in a stressful situation. So Again, this also does tie back to why this, why do some people, you know, handle themselves better to stress than others. Genetics can be an explanation. People just might have their genes, their bodies might be better, more equipped to handle stress and their stress response systems may operate at a higher functioning level. So how can exercise help with depression? Um, it helps in many of the same ways as it does for stress and anxiety. So it is a healthy coping behavior. Um, instead of engaging in unhealthy behaviors, such as maybe excessive eating, drinking, um, or any sort of unhealthy behavior, it, exercise is a rather healthy behavior. 
it can provide social contact. So sometimes, um, you know, just having that social contact with other individuals might help. It can improve self-esteem and self-confidence. It upregulates those feel-good brain chemicals. So like I said, serotonin, dopamine, levels that can often be negatively affected in depressed individuals. Exercise can upregulate that production. And it contributes to overall brain health. So studies have looked at specifically exercise versus traditional therapies for depression, such as medications or psychotherapy. And what these studies have found is that exercise may be as effective for reducing symptoms of depression as antidepressants or psychotherapy. So in some cases, they've looked, studies have looked at, they've given one group of individuals who've been diagnosed with depression um, an exercise intervention. And an exercise for a certain amount of time and a certain intensity. And they've given other individuals treatment as usual, so medication or um, therapy sessions. And at the end of the intervention, they've seen that both groups actually improve the same. Um, however, this, again, I'm not saying the exercise is a full substitute. That is something that you would certainly want to talk to a mental health professional about. Um, lastly, studies have also found that it can be more effective for treating depression than receiving no treatment at all. So exercise can be a great starting point as it's a free, easy to um, use, and it can be really a helpful therapy. So ultimately, how can exercise help with mental health? At the end of the day, the most important message I have is any exercise is good exercise. Anything you do that is fun, is enjoyable, that gets your body moving is great and is a great first step. Most of the exercise and mental health research has traditionally focused on aerobic exercise. So that's jogging, walking, anything that gets your heart rate up and beating, your um, breath quick. And that's because, you know, you're trying to activate those same stress response systems as a normal, as a normal stress, stress rate would. However, mindfulness exercises such as yoga um, or resistance exercise can also offer benefits. Again, those can really contribute to that timeout hypothesis. So taking a break, um, doing a distraction. Also, lots, lots of research has been conducted with yoga about how breathing practices increase that oxygen to your brain, um, or how yoga can actually positively affect different components on your brain. So even alternative forms of exercise can be very beneficial. Studies have found that people have reported feeling calmer even 20 to 30 minutes um, after exercise, and this calming effect can last for several hours. Ultimately, across the board, there is no official recommendation for if you do exercise at this intensity for this much amount of time, you will be feel better. Um, there's there's some of the consensus. However, overall recommendations for exercise to improve mental health are in line with the current CDC exercise recommendations. So these exercise recommendations right here are issued. Um, as general guidelines of the minimum amount of exercise you should do per week um, to optimize your health and physical functioning. And these also are well in line with helping stress, anxiety, and or depression. So I wanted to end on some tips to start exercise. Um, most important thing over and over is find forms of exercise that are fun and enjoyable. Again, you are you're going to get the most out of exercising if there is something that you look forward to. Um, set small daily goals. This is very important. Some people might feel, you know, especially if you are depressed or anxious or stressed, you might feel overwhelmed to start exercising. It might feel like a very big undertaking, and it does not have to be. Um, you do not have to set out your exercise goals by running a marathon or training for a marathon. Just aiming for that daily consistency rather than perfect workouts. Just starting by going for a short walk um, or doing something small. Anything that starting small is great. Um, a great rule of thumb is five times 30. So once you start to build up to exercise and you start to feel more comfortable, you know, try and establish that consistency, making it a habit of breaking the exercise into two 10 to 15 minute sessions. You can do one before work and one after work. Uh, some people might find really beneficial to distract yourself while exercising by listening to music um, or downloading audiobooks, podcasts, music. Personally, I love exercising and going for runs or walks, listening to podcasts. Um, you know, it makes the workout go by quicker and you learn something new by the end. 
uh, it can also be very helpful to recruit an exercise buddy. Um, so when you have a buddy that you are committed to, and you know that they're counting on you to show up or do the access with them, this can help you um, by being the, having that capability. And also fun, it's a great opportunity to catch up with some friends um, or family members. And the most important thing is be patient when you start that new exercise program. Um, it's been suggested that it might take up to four to eight weeks to start to feel coordinated and sufficiently comfortable um, to where exercise feels easier. So be patient um, and again, those small daily goals. Uh, here's some resources if you're interested to learn more about exercise and mental health. I have a couple of podcasts that focus on um, mental health and how exercise and moving your body can be very beneficial. A couple books about how you can use exercise to help. Um, the second one, Spark, uh, talks about such how that relationship between exercise and the brain and a couple of web, national websites um, about these mental health uh, things. And next week, lastly, talking how diet can impact your gut microbiome and health. Um, so that kind of segues from what I talked about previously. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned a lot and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Emily. Um, I went ahead and put the handout link and the evaluation link in the chat box. So if, if those of you that are interested in the handout and please um, give us some feedback on the evaluation, I'll put that in again. Also, um, I'm going to bring up a poll very quickly um, that asks for a little bit of your demographics. Um, should have done this at the beginning, I apologize. But if you could uh, answer that very quickly to give us an idea of who's tuned in today um, and that we're reaching everyone that, that we need to be reaching, that would be wonderful. Okay. I'm going to put that information in the chat box again with the handout and the evaluation. Um, there was a question quickly, uh, Emily, about what, is there any specific research between um, about Tai Chi as exercise and depression? Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? No, so I I would say yes. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know or specifically, but I do know that that type of mind body exercise, so yoga and Tai Chi, um, are widely researched um, for their benefits. So. Definitely, you know, even if you were to do a quick Google search, I'm sure you'll find information that is an area of research that, again, I'm not too familiar with, but I do know it exists. Okay. And yeah, so, but yeah, if ta yeah, yeah. If there's any other questions, you can put them in the chat box. I know we're getting a little past one o'clock, and so some of you are going to have to leave, but um, if you want to stay and ask any questions, that's great. Mm -hmm. And I'm, this, this session has been recorded, so um, you'll be receiving an email um, following with the evaluation link again and um, a link for the recording as well.